Hello, everyone. This is our second video for Chapter 11. Um, I'm going to go over two problems that I feel are particularly useful in illustrating some of the concepts and uh, equations that we've used so far in the first lecture. Um, these two problems are pretty complicated. They seem deceptively simple at first, but there's lots of little things that we can reinforce as we go through and make sure that we know how to handle. So let's get started. The first problem is the Atwood machine with rotating pulleys that have mass. And um, I'm gonna do this two ways. The first way I'm gonna do it is with torque, the second way with energy. Um, but this particular problem, we have um, a composite pulley system meaning we have two pulleys that are welded together, one larger than the other. Um, on the outer pulley, we have a mass one attached, and on the inner pulley, we have mass two attached. And we're gonna let the thing start from rest, and then when we let it go, mass one is gonna rise with acceleration one, mass two is going to drop with acceleration two, and the two pulleys are going to turn together as one composite pulley with a clockwise angular acceleration, uh, angular um, meaning alpha. Note that A1 will not be equal to A2 because they are at different radiuses. Um, also note that our inner pulley and our outer pulley have different masses and different radiuses. So let me call this radius one, and this will be pulley one. The outer pulley will be pulley one. This will be radius two, and the inner pulley will be pulley two. Now the mass of pulley one will be seven kilograms, and the radius of pulley one will be three meters. And the mass of pulley two will be three kilograms, and the radius of pulley two will be one meter. Okay, um, that's all we need to start. What we wanna find is we wanna know what alpha is once we let the thing start to move. We wanna know what A1 is, and we wanna know what A2 is. And then eventually, after it's gone through, after one rotation, one rotation, meaning after it's gone through two pi rad, we want to know what V1 final is, what V2 final is, and what omega final is. So the initial values of those will all be zero because it's at rest, but um, we need to know what the final velocities of each mass are and the final angular velocity is of the two pulleys. All right, so how we start this problem is we have two pulleys that are welded together to form one um, single object. The moment of inertia of a single pulley is mr squared over 2. It's just the moment of inertia of a disk. But when we have two of them welded together so that they turn as a single object, the total moment of inertia is m of pulley 1 times r1 squared over 2 plus m of pulley 2 times r2 squared over 2 or simply the um, composite or sum of the two uh, moment of inertias together. So let's figure out what this is. Um, this was seven and this was three squared over two. This was three and one meter squared over two. So here I have seven times nine is 63 halves, plus three halves is 66 halves, which is 33 kilogram meters squared. Pretty simple. Um, for the rest of this problem, I might write I, I mean I total. Um, we'll always treat the moment of inertia of the rotating part of the system as having a moment of inertia of the total of the two composite pulleys. So, um, I will be 33 kilogram meters squared. Okay, so now on to harder stuff. Um, I just wanted to make sure you keep that in mind. There's a lab later on that we might have to do some stuff with that. Um, so as we always did, 
back when we studied chapter four on Newtonian equations of motion. Our first step is a free body diagram. And because we have rotation, we'll need to draw a torque diagram. So remember that on a free body diagram, you always, um, all vectors, and you have to include A. So positive or negative. And then on a torque diagram, you include R and the forces, and you always have alpha as positive and negative. Okay, just always remember that that's what you need. Um, we're gonna draw them really fast underneath here. So for mass one, what are the forces on it? We have a tension one, and we have a weight M1G. And as we stated before, we have A1 going up. For mass two, we again have M2G, and we have a tension two pulling up on it, and A2 is going to be going down. So if we look back at this, um, there's a tension one, there's a weight, M1G, and A1 goes up. We have a tension two, M2G goes down, and A2 goes down. But on the torque diagram, this is a little different than what we did because we actually have two torques here. So we're gonna draw the center of mass of the composite pulleys, that's our axis of rotation. And we have at a distance of R1, we have tension one going down. And then at a distance of R2, we have tension two going down. And remember that these are going to be turning clockwise. So the whole thing here is going to have a negative alpha, okay? This torque, if we draw it, um, R1, T1, we see that the rotation is through a positive angle of 90 degrees. So this torque, T1, is R1, T1. And then for our second torque, if we put the two vectors tail to tail, we notice that R turned to T gives us a negative alpha. So T2 is going to be negative R2, T2. So the sum of our torques is just T1 plus T2, which is R1, T1 minus R2, T2. Um, just bear that in mind for the next part, okay? So fairly straightforward, um, just remember that you always, always, always need to include the uh, angular acceleration and the accelerations on the free body diagrams. All right, so our equations of motion. If we look back here, we have that M1A1 is equal to T1 minus M1G. So M1, a1 is equal to T1 minus M1G. Um, M2A2 is M2G minus T2. M2A2 is T2, my, uh, sorry, it's not T2. It's M2 T2 or M2G minus T2. And finally, Remember that we have a negative alpha. So for our torque equation, we have negative I alpha is equal to the sum of the torques T1 plus T2, which was R1 T1 minus R2 T2. And so we need to do a little bit of work now um, before we move on. Let's set this equal to T1 and set this equal to T2. So T1 is M1A1 plus M1G. And T2 is M2G minus M2A2, okay? Also keep in mind, A1 does not equal A2, um, but we do have our rolling without slipping condition. So A is equal to R alpha. 
And then here I want to distribute this negative sign. So I get I alpha is R2 T2 minus R1 T1. And now I have um, something I'm going to do really fast here, keeping this in mind. So A1 is equal to R alpha, R1 alpha, and A2 is equal to R2 alpha. Alpha is the same for both pulleys. So there's no alpha one or alpha two. Alpha is always the same. They're going to rotate through the same angle in the same amount of time. Um, so I'm going to write this as M1 R1 alpha plus M1G. And I'm going to write this as M2G minus M2 R2 alpha. I'm just substituting A2 here and I'm substituting A1 there. So now my torque equation, I can write as R2 times M2G minus M2 R2 alpha minus R1 times uh, T1, M1 R1 alpha plus M1G. And what this gives me, if I move all my alphas over, I get alpha times I, remember this is I total, um, plus M2R2, that's this term, um, R2 squared, um, plus M1R1 squared is equal to M2R2G minus M1R1G, okay? So now I have this equation that I can solve for alpha. Um, all right, that was just some algebra and getting the equations from the free body diagram and the torque diagram, making a few quick substitutions. Um, there's not a lot there. The only thing to remember is that you have your rolling without slipping condition so that you can um, convert your A1 and A2 into alpha Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to solve it. You would have an equation with three unknowns. And um, all right, so how do we find the linear and angular accelerations of each mass from this equation that we have? So we have this equation that says alpha is equal to m2 r2 times g minus m1 r1 g divided by um, i plus m2 r2 squared plus m2 r sorry m1 r1 squared and one thing i want you to note is if we go back and look so this force is positive and this force is negative as far as trying to make this thing turn the tension due to this guy is trying to pull it back and not let it turn clockwise. The tension from mass two is trying to make it turn clockwise. And that's what this equation is telling us, that they, the mass two is trying to make it turn. Mass one is um, making it not turn, is making it turn the opposite direction. And then we're dividing by all the masses um, in their rotational form. So, we know everything in this equation. Remember that mass two was 15. So we get 15. R2 was, um, was one, 9.81 minus um, mass one was four. R1 was three, and this is 9.81 over, this was 33 plus mass two was 15 times one squared plus uh, four times three squared. And that basically gives us 15 minus 12, which is three times 9.81, divided by uh, 33 plus 15 is 48, plus 36 is 84. Um, let me double check myself. Uh, 84. And therefore, we get um, 3 times 
divided by 84, we get 0 0.35 rad per second squared. That is our angular acceleration. Um, how, though, are we going to get A1 and A2? So we have alpha. A1 and A2 is the next thing that I asked for. Well, recall that this is um, rolling without slipping. So we have R1 alpha and we have R2 alpha. We can justify rolling without slipping because we're assuming that there's no friction in these ropes, so and there's no stretching in these ropes, there's no force in these ropes and slowing it down. Um, if you recall, R1 was three, so this is three times 0 0.35, and R2 was one meter. This is obviously 0.35 meter per second squared. And this is nine one point oh five meter per second squared. So we have our first half of our answer. Um, it's not too tough. There's a lot of little things here. Um, remember that when you have several objects that are making up your system, the total moment of inertia is the individual moment of inertia is added together. Remember that on your free body diagrams, always give A and always give um, alpha on your torque diagrams. And then on your equations of motion, um, remember that you have the rolling without slipping condition sometimes. Um, we'll see also problems where it doesn't work, but I'll, uh, I'll get to that later at some other point in some other video. And then it's just some tedious algebra. We get our answers. So. Let's remember what these are really fast. Um, A1 and A2, I want to write those down. This was 1.05 meter per second squared, and this is 0 0.35 meter per second squared. All right, so now um, something I want to talk about is during one rotation. So basically, when this goes completely around once, if it has a radius, the distance, the arc length is two pi times r. It's the change of theta times r. Well, our change of theta in one rotation is two pi. So we know this arc length is our change of x for mass one, I'm gonna call it one, is two pi times r one, which is two pi times three, which is six pi and six pi is 18.85, I believe. Um, 18.85 meters. All right. And then for the change of x2, this is mass two, we get two pi times r2. And so while mass one rises a distance of 18.85 meters, mass two falls a distance of two pi times one, which is uh, 6.28 meters, okay? They have different um, displacements, which makes sense because they're at different um, parts of the circle, basically. Um, mass one goes up further. It has a further distance to travel around the circle. Both pulleys are making the same um, angular displacement of two pi, but since uh, pulley one is bigger, it has a larger arc length. That's pretty simple. So let's find the linear velocity. Remember that A1 was 1.05 uh, meter per second squared, and A2 was 0 0.35 meter per second squared. And then we're assuming these are constant forces. And we know that V squared minus V naught squared is equal to two A times the change in X for constant acceleration. We also know that if we begin at zero, this goes away and we get that V final is the square root of two A times Delta X. Um, before we do that though, for uh, mass one and mass two, let's also note that omega squared, omega final squared, minus omega initial squared is two alpha times the change in angle, 
and we know that this change in angle was two pi. So, and this began at rest. So omega final is two alpha times um, delta theta. We're gonna find these in a couple different ways. So for V1, I have the square root of two times A1 times delta X1, right? And so this was two times 1.05, times 18.85, which is, I should really write final there, but um, which is two times 1.05 times 18.85 is 6.29 meters per second. And V2 is the same, uh, two times A2 times the change in X2 which is two times 0 0.35 times 6.28, which is 0.35 times 6.28, which is 2.07. All right, let's find omega final. Um, remember that our alpha was 0 0.35 and that this was two pi. So we have the square root of two times 0.35 times two times pi, and I get 2.1, 2 2.1 rad per second. As a quick check, I could have found this and then gone V1 is R1 times omega final. Um, And remember that R1 is um, three. So you can look right here in 6.3, this is 6.29. V2 was R2 omega final, which was uh, one times omega final. Uh, there's some rounding going on here, which is why the numbers aren't quite adding up, but 2.07 versus 2.1, um, pretty close. All right. Um, so that's a lot, a lot of work actually um, goes into that to determine how, um, what the final velocity for V1 and V2 were and what the final omega was. Like we learned when we did energy, we can do this with energy. Uh, we need to think a little bit more, um, think a little bit harder, but the math is much easier. So let's solve this problem using energy. Um, so the first thing I want to make sure you remember is we need to determine after one rotation, before we do anything else, um, after one rotation, what the height change is going to be, okay? So mass one, I'm going to say H1 initial is zero, and it's going to go up that same delta x um, is going to go up two pi times r1. So h1 final is two pi times r1, which was six pi, which was 18.85 meters. For m2, I'm gonna say h2 initial was zero and it's going to drop. So h2 final is going to be minus two pi r2 which is minus 6.28 uh, um, meters, minus, okay? So other than that, um, that's all we need. Remember that when we do our initial energy, all we have to write is the different energy that each thing has. So let's look back at this. Um, mass one um, is going to go up it's uh, going to have potential energy of gravity. It's going to have kinetic energy. Mass two is going to have potential energy of gravity, kinetic energy. It won't have spring. There's no friction. And the last thing we have is we have the rotation, the rotational kinetic energy of the pulleys. Let's remember this. We have mass one, V1 initial squared over two, plus mass one, G, H1 initial. Similarly for um, 
mass two. And then recall that the kinetic energy of rotation is I omega squared over two. So this will be I total omega initial squared over two for the pulleys, the initial moment of inertia of those pulleys, right? Um, that's it. The next step here is that we know V1 initial, V1 or V2 initial, H1 initial, H2 initial, and omega initial, oh, sorry, omega initial are all zero by the way we chose. Because I chose H1 initial and H2 initial to be zero. So my initial energy is zero. Easy enough. Um, the final energy is going to be exactly the same, except everything's going to have a final subscript. So M1 uh, G H1 final uh, plus M1 B1 final squared over two plus M2 G H2 final plus M2 V2 final squared over two plus I total omega final squared over two. Now, <clears throat> the next step here is that E initial is equal to E final, so I can set this equal to zero. And what I get is I get that I total omega final squared over two plus M1 V1 final squared over two plus M2 V2 final squared over two is equal to negative. I'm gonna move this and this over. So negative M1 G H1 final minus M2 G H2 final, okay? And that's it. Um, what I'm going to end up doing here is I know that V1 final is equal to R1 omega final and V2 final is equal to R2 omega final. So I'm gonna put those in um, next and then I'll have the only thing I won't know in this is omega final, okay? Finding the angular velocity and the linear velocity of each mass. So as I said, we have I total omega final squared over two plus M1 um, R1 squared V1 final squared, I'm sorry, uh, omega final squared over two. So note, let's go back. If I put this in here, I have to square it. So R1 squared, omega final squared. Same with the next term. Um, M2, R2 squared, omega final squared over two is equal to M, I'm gonna change these around. R2, uh, sorry, not R2. Um, M2, G, H2 final minus M1 G H1 final. Remember they both have negative signs, but I know H2 final is negative, so I'm gonna put that term first for now. On this side, I'm gonna collect terms. I get I total over two plus M1 R1 squared over two plus M2 R2 squared over two is equal to still M2 G H2 final minus M1 G H1 final. The last thing I'm gonna do is H final squared is negative M2 G H2 final minus M1 G H1 final over this stuff. I total divided by two plus M1 R1 squared over two plus M2 R2 squared over two. And real quickly, um, so M2 was 15, this is G, and H2 was minus six. Um, so this is 15 
times 6.28 minus um, M1 was four, um, H was 18.85, and then I'm gonna multiply that whole thing by G. And this was 33 divided by two, plus um, M1 was uh, four times three squared is 36 divided by two. Um, M2 was 15, R2 was one. So this is 15 halves, okay? And so what I get here is I get um, 15 times 6.28 minus four times 18.85 is 18.8 .8 times 9.81 is 184, 184.428. 184 divided by 69, 74, 84 divided by two, which is 41, right? And I get 4.5. Um, so this is omega squared. So omega final is the square root of 4.498. Um, which is 2.12. Um, again, I have some small issues. Um, my initial, uh, in the original problem, I got that it was 2.1. Um, with energy, I've got that it's 2.12. Um, I will really quickly, uh, noting that omega final is 2.12 rad per second, I can find V1 final and V2 final using R1 omega and R2 omega final. And remember that this R1 is three, so this is uh, three times 2.12, which is 6.36 meter per second. And this was one times 2.12, which is 2.12 meters per second. And again, um, if you go back and look, we got 6.29 and 2.07. So our numbers are um, a little bit off. They're a little off from rounding um, errors that I made, uh, but they're close. So using energy, I think it's easier. It requires a little bit of, um, a little bit more insight into what's going on. Um, but I would definitely prefer doing energy over doing the torques and Newton's equations. Um, the one thing that it's not gonna tell us is the accelerations, although we could find those because we could go back and use omega final squared minus omega initial squared is equal to two times alpha um, times the change in angle. And we know this change of angle was two pi. So alpha is essentially omega final squared over two that, which was uh, 2.12 squared over two times two pi. And that should give us um, 2.12 times 2.2 divided by four pi gives us 0.357. So it's a little bit off, um, mostly because my omega final is off by 0.02, but, um, it's close. So we could find alpha and then we could find A1 and we could find A2. Um, the hard work's been done though. So let's move on to another question. Um, there's a lot of words here. I just wanted to make sure that you all had this background information. I'll draw it up in a second and that might make it easier to understand. But what we have is we're gonna have a hollow sphere at the top of an incline, it's going to, this incline is going to have a 40 degree, degree incline. And the length along parallel to the surface of the incline is 20 meters. There's enough static friction there to allow the sphere to roll without slipping. And then at the bottom of the incline, when the ground becomes level, 
they're going to be a coefficient of kinetic friction of 0 0.8. Uh, mu is 0 0.8. Uh, if we assume the sphere starts from rest at the top of the incline, it travels down, reaches level ground, and stops due to friction. So um, again, we want to know what the maximum angular velocity of the sphere is, how far along the level ground it will travel before its angular velocity is half the maximum angular velocity it attained. And then the sphere has a mass of one kilogram and it has a radius of 0.2 meters. And for this problem, the moment of inertia of this hollow sphere is three-fifths mr squared. Okay, so let me draw that just real fast. Um, just to make sure everyone sees what's going on. Um, so here, I have a plane, an inclined plane at 40 degrees. I have a hollow sphere. This distance to the ground is 20 meters. And this area here has friction. There is static friction on the inclined plane, but it's just enough to provide the rotation. It's not actually going to do any work to slow the object down. Um, and so what we want to know is omega max and then x, this is x, x when omega max is half, okay? So let's start by, we want the linear and angular velocity at the bottom of the inclined plane and the maximum velocity, and we want you to use acceleration. Um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to use energy. So this problem starting from first principles, you could do all this um, free body diagram and stuff, but we already know that as long as there's no friction other than the static friction for rolling, we saw that the acceleration down the incline was g sine theta over one plus i over m r squared. Okay. And we said at the beginning of this problem that I was three fifths. So if I is three fifths mr squared, we get that A is G sine theta one plus three fifths mr squared over mr squared, or we get G times sine of 40 over. Uh, one plus three fifths, which is eight fifths. So this is five G over eight times sine of 40. And I want you to pay special attention to that. But our acceleration is therefore um, five divided by eight um, times 9.81 times sine of 40. And that is 3.94. Um, meters per second squared. And the maximum velocity at the bottom, if that is our acceleration, using is equal to 2a times the change in x. Going back to this picture, the change in x is the distance down the incline, because this is the acceleration down the incline, and it started from rest. So v final is simply 2 times our 3.94 times our 20. And that will give us um, two times 20 times 3.94. That'll give us 12.6 meters per second. Okay. So we found um, the maximum velocity at the bottom of the incline plane and the maximum velocity is going to occur at the bottom of the incline plane. Using this equation that we learned in lecture 11, chapter 11, part one. This was the acceleration down an incline plane for a rotating object, okay? Now let's use energy. So at the top of, we need H. So at the top, what energy does this thing have? So this is zero and this is final. So the, the initial, all it has is mgh, right? Um, 
So let's say that H is zero here and H is H here. Um, so all it has is H. H, if this is 20 and our angle is 40, H is 20 sine of 40, which is 20 times sine of 40 is 12.86 meters. Why do we want H? Because the force of gravity is down and our displacement, um, remember that the work has to be R dot F, which means the component of the displacement in the direction of F and our R in the direction of F is H, not X down the plane here. Okay. So we know that E initial is MGH, where H is going to be the 12.86, H initial. H final will be zero. And so our E final would be MGH final plus the translational um, kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy, right? We want to find this maximum velocity. Now we know this is zero. Um, and if we use that omega is equal to V over R, we get that the final energy is M V final squared over two plus I V final squared over two R squared. Okay. So now, Let's find the energy. Energy initial is equal to energy final. So we have MGH initial is MV final squared over two plus I V final squared over two R squared. And remember that I we said was three fifths um, M R squared. Okay. So plugging that in, we get that this is MV final squared over two plus um, three fifths M R squared over R squared times V final squared over two. And these R's are gonna cancel. And so what we get is that MG H naught is M over two times V final squared plus three over 10 um, M V final squared. Let's cancel all our M's. Let's do this fraction real fast. This fraction is eight tenths V final squared or 0.8. So we get um, 10 over eight times G H initial is V final squared or V final is 10 over eight G H naught and H naught we saw was 12.86 meters. So putting that into your calculator, 12.86 times 9.81 times 10 divided by eight is 12.56 meters per second. Was that what we got when we did it before um, in the previous? I hope it was. We got 12.6 here. I rounded. So our V final is 12.6. 12.6 meters per second. And our omega final is, again, since omega is V over R, this is V final over our R is 12.6 divided by the radius of our sphere. And the problem was 0 0.2. So let's put in 0 0.2. And we get 12.6 divided by 0 0.2 is 63 rads per second, or radians per second. Okay. Um, so the velocity at the bottom of the inclined plane has a maximum velocity of 12.6 meters per second and 
at the same time, it's turning with an angular velocity of 63 rads per second. So at what point does the sphere reach half its maximum angular velocity? Well, notice that when this thing goes down, right as it reaches the ground, it reaches the maximum. And we know that we just found that was 63, right? So the max is 63 rad per second. Okay. And <clears throat> so we want to know what the energy is. This is going to be my way of doing it. Um, we want to know what the energy is at this time because it started off with an energy of mgh naught. And that would have been, um, remember that our mass was one kilogram and our initial height um, was 12.86. So one times 9.8, one times 12.86 is, 9.81 times 12.86 is 126 joules. So initially, that initial energy at the top of the inclined plane was 126 joules. It's going to have that same energy when it gets to the bottom, although it's going to convert it all to kinetic energy and of rotation and translation. And then as it passes along here, it's going to lose energy due to friction. Um, and we were given, so the work of friction, remember, is uh, F dot D. So the force of friction, we're going to assume in this problem is mu mg. So we get mu mg times x. And we want to know what x is um, for the change of energy. So when it gets to the point where it has half, um, so omega max to the half is half of 63, which is 31.5. So when it's uh, angular velocity is 31.5, how much energy does it have? So the only energy it has at any time um, when it's on the horizontal portion is mv squared over two plus i omega squared over two. And we know what omega is at the position that we want to find. We can convert using v is r omega. So this becomes mr squared v squared over two plus i, um, I'm sorry, um, r omega, i omega squared over two, where omega is this omega squared to the half. Um, doing this really fast, we know that the mass is one, the radius is 0.2, if we go back and look, it was 0.2. So this is 1 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 times uh, 31.5 times 31.5 times a half plus um, 3 fifths times 1 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.5 um, times 0.5 times 31.5 times 31.5. Um, so let me do that really fast. So this is 1 times 0.2 squared times um, 31.5 squared over 2 plus 3 fifths times 1 times 0.2 squared over 2. Um, times 31.5 squared over two. So recall that I is mr squared over, I'm sorry, three fifths. So I need to get rid of that. It's three fifths mr squared. Um, so this is, um, 1 times 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.5 times 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.5 times 0.2 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 times 
times 31.5 times 31.5 plus 3 over 10 times 0.2 times 0.2 times 31.5 times 31.5. Um, I get that the energy here is 31.752, assuming I did it correctly. Um, so I know that the energy was initially um, 126 joules at the energy when omega is half it only has we found 31.752 and so that is a change in energy equal to 126 minus 31.752 or 126 minus or 94.25 joules of energy was lost. So the change in energy is equal to the work done by friction. So this 94.25 is equal to mu mg times x. And solving for x, we get 94.25 divided by mu mg. x is therefore 94.25. This was 0.8, our mass was one, this is 9.81, and we get 12 meters, almost dead on, okay? Um, and that's it, that's, I jumped ahead a slide, but that's it. So in this problem, um, to outline it, we found we found omega max using energy, um, using the energy at the top of the inclined plane and the energy at the bottom of the inclined plane. Then we found um, the energy when omega max was half. That's what we did here. Um, so we found at the bottom here when omega half was, well, omega was half of maximum. And then we subtracted, we took the change in energy and set that equal to the work done by friction. And use that to find X. A um, little complicated, a uh, little long, but it's, a good problem because it makes sure that you understand the work done by friction, you understand energy, you understand kinetic energy of rotation, um, and it's got that little wrinkle where you're being asked to solve for a non-specific time, not a time when it's at rest or a time when it's at maximum speed. Um, I like this problem. It would have been a good exam problem um, or a good final problem, but um, Hopefully you find it instructive and useful and I'll see you next time. Um, I'm going to post chapter 11 part two, probably Wednesday morning. So be healthy, stay safe. I'll talk to you all later.